Hey, welcome everybody. Well, I have 6.30 Eastern in my time, so I'm really pleased that you everyone can join us this evening. Uh, I want to make sure that uh, everyone's aware that we're recording this afternoon, So, or this evening, it's this afternoon for Paul. So if you missed part of it or you want to share this with your friends, we'll eventually have it available for you to watch later. Uh, let me introduce myself to get started. My name is Bill Crossley. I'm the J. William Urich and Anastasia Bornas Head of Aeronautics and Astronautics here at Purdue University. And part of my job means I get to introduce many of our alumni and guests and distinguished colleagues who come to speak. And Paul is actually all of above, our speaker tonight. Uh, let me tell you first a little bit about the Neil Armstrong Distinguished Visiting Fellows. And this is Paul Bevelock, our speaker, as part of that program. This program started in 2019, and Paul was part of the first cadre of Neil Armstrong Distinguished Visiting Fellows that are participating with us in the College of Engineering here at Purdue. Uh, these fellows are individuals who've been recognized for their impact and achievements in engineering or closely related fields. We bring in the distinguished visiting fellows to interact with our faculty, to discuss potential research projects, to interact with our students, to share their insights with us and the larger Purdue community. And so Paul is going to do that tonight as part of his uh, visiting fellow uh, title. He's going to give us a talk about value. And one of the things I think is really exciting here, and I told Paul when he was uh, getting ready to do this talk, that it's really exciting to me to have an aeronamicist by training and, and educational background talking about the importance of cost and value to the design of aerospace systems. So to me, I think this is a neat compliment. It's one of the things that we maybe don't do as well as we could in academia. So Paul bringing his experience and, and thinking about that to us is going to be a great idea. Um, I, I don't know if Paul remembers, he probably does, but I was actually fortunate enough to meet Paul when I joined the AAA VSTOL Systems Technical Committee back when I was much, much younger uh, and when I was a McDonnell Douglas Helicopter System. So it's kind of neat to have such a small world going on here and, and being able to introduce Paul as a, an alum of the school for which I'm head to talk this evening. Paul truly is a remarkable, had a remarkable career and remarkable engineer. He had his MS and PhD degrees from us here in Aeronautics and Astronautics at Purdue while he was a commissioned Air Force officer. He did a lot of research in turbulent wakes. And if it's okay, if I mention that, Paul, the picture above the door behind him is actually taken from his thesis. And we were just talking about that. He, he took that research expertise over to uh, Wright Labs at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, where he worked on turbulent jets that they were studying to provide vertical takeoff and landing capabilities for both interceptor aircraft and search and rescue aircraft. And after he finished his tour at, as an Air Force officer, he then went to Rockwell International in Columbus where he also worked on Beastel aircraft systems. As Rockwell basically closed up their business, he moved over to Lockheed Martin Skunk Works, where he eventually rose to the position of chief engineer there. Most people are probably familiar with Paul's role in the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, and importantly, the lift fan that really made that concept a viable concept to have the three different versions of the vehicle, one of which has that vertical and short take, vertical short takeoff and landing. Paul's work has been uh, recognized by many different organizations. He's a member of the National Academy of Engineering. He's a fellow of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. He's a recipient of the AIAA Aircraft Design Award, the AHS International Paul Harder Award. He was voted the Engineer of the Year by Design News. He was part of the team that won the X30, the Collier Trophy for the X35. He's won AIAA's Guggenheim Award, which is the highest award in aeronautics from our professional society, AIAA. And certainly in my mind, among the most important, we recognized Paul as an outstanding aerospace engineer here at Purdue in 2002 and a distinguished engineering alum in 2005. So I'm incredibly excited to have Paul give this talk about designing for value. Before I turn Paul loose, let me mention a couple of things real quick for those of you who are participating. As we go through the, the talk this afternoon, feel free to post questions for Paul. This is a Zoom webinar. And so at the bottom of your screen, there should be a little window that says Q&A. And if you post your question there, we'll be able to keep track of that. And when Paul finishes his, his discussion, uh, my colleague, Professor Karen Murray will help moderate the question and answers. So feel free to post those as we go along. You can certainly post them at the end. And with that, I'm going to end my housekeeping duties. And I'm so happy to have you, Dr. Paul bevel Go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you, Bill. Um, let me get my charts up on screen here.
Okay, I hope you can all see that. We got it, Paul. That's really good. I'm going to go ahead and turn off my camera and mute, and then I'll, I'll come back at the end to introduce Karen. Okay. <clears throat> well, I'm going to be, talk about uh, something new in uh, aircraft design, designing for best value. So by best value, I mean uh, that it's affordable for the customer who gets what he wants for a price he can afford it and still profitable for the company. Um, here on this chart, I've got a couple of airplanes that didn't um, satisfy the best value criteria. The Concorde, uh-oh, now it's catching up. The Concorde um, was very expensive and uh, they built about 20 of them and never was successful, made money for the company. Airbus was uh, probably the wrong airplane for the current market. It was designed to carry 600 people from, for example, Frankfurt to Miami and they couldn't find 600 people every day. So I understand it was just announced last week that it's going out of production. Um, Boeing was very courageous in designing the Dreamliner. Usually we wait for the military to prove a new technology and then we adapt it for the commercial purposes, but they went ahead and did an all composite airplane and um, it was very expensive because it was such a new uh, technology and they may never make money with that airplane. You've probably read that they've been having problems with development. So let me talk about how performance has a cost um, here are three airplanes, fighters. The F-16 is Mach 2 and costs 28 million. The F-15 is Mach 2.5, costs 52 million. And the SR-71 is Mach 3 and costs 135 million. But the hidden cost is that uh, at 28 million, they sold 4,600 F-16s. And for a total program value of $129 billion. The F-15, they only sold 1,200 and a total program value of 62 billion. And the SR sold 32 of them for a program value of 4 billion. So performance has a cost, direct cost in the airplane, but also a hidden cost. And it's that hidden cost that I'm gonna to try to address today. Really that reflects what we saw in the previous chart reflects the Pareto rule. Pareto was an Italian civil engineer about 100 years ago. And as a civil engineer, he had his own business. And he analyzed his business and found that 20% of his customers were providing 80% of his profits. And he had a pea garden out back. He observed that 20% of the plants were producing 80% of the peas. And then he looked at uh, land ownership in Europe at that time. He found 20% of the people owned 80% of the land. And so um, he published what he called the Pareto rule based on those observations and other things that were current at that time. This is a more recent version of that rule from Norm Augustine's book. And it covers a wide variety of um, things, optical lens, focal lengths, <clears throat> salary of ball players is a function of their batting average, the speed of airplanes, there's the F-16, F-15, F-14, and SR-71, the cost of diamonds, the accuracy of machine parts, etc. And they all follow that rule that you get 80% of the performance for 20% of the costs. <coughs> and the last 20% of performance runs you 80% of the costs. It's probably a reflection of the law of diminishing returns. If you can increase the cost without limit, but the value of increased performance um, diminishes. For example, if you're in a dark room, you light one candle, it makes a difference. But if you have a thousand candles lit and you light the thousand and first, it doesn't really make a difference. <clears throat> so that's the Pareto rule. And, um, we have these equations that we use to calculate the cost of an airplane. This, uh, each company has their own proprietary system. The government has its proprietary system. So a lot of room for negotiation when we're negotiating a contract. But this is the RAND equations from about 1985. And um, you can see that the major driving parameter is the weight and then the speed 
and the number of aircraft and other things like G's and range and payload are higher order terms. So I just focus on these first three first order terms. So costs for, for, fall into two categories, the non-recurring costs of development, engineering hours, testing and flight test. And then the recurring costs are the cost of building each airplane, engineering hours for sustaining work, actual manufacturing labor, manufacturing tooling and manufacturing materials. <clears throat> but these equations don't include the, that hidden cost of performance. And it's hard to get data for commercial airplanes. Here's one I can tell you about because I work for Lockheed. Um, they came up with the concept of the Trijet and it was a Cadillac. And in fact, there's an example visible here in these pictures. The third engine was mounted on the center line of the airplane so that it didn't induce a pitching moment, but it required the development of a very sophisticated S duct to take air from above the uh, fuselage down to the in inlet of the engine. And they changed the cross section shape of the duct to control the passage vortices that developed and assure that they got <clears throat> uniform flow at the engine face. But it was very expensive. So um, American Airlines did something that I think was probably unethical, but they went with the drawings to um, Douglas Aircraft and said, can you build us a Chevy version of this airplane? And you can see what they did. They eliminated the um, S duct and just mounted the engine on the tail. It was simpler, but now you had a nose down pitching moment and you had to trim that out. Unfortunately, marketing, it said there was a market for a hundred of these airplanes and both Lockheed and Douglas sold 50 apiece. Both went bankrupt. Douglas was purchased by McDonnell. Lockheed had a loan that the government guaranteed and was able to stay in business. But uh, there's the penalty, hidden cost of performance. I mentioned that we don't really know about the commercial prices because it's, they sell them like cars. There's an MSRP, Manufacturer Suggested Retail Price, but nobody pays that. And we don't know what they actually cost, but the military aircraft are a matter of record. They're in the Congressional Digest, which you can look up and see what they cost over the years. Um, so here's this number of airplanes that went through some rough times. And you can see here, as the costs went up, the numbers of the aircraft went down. And in fact, uh, the US 101 was a classic example of what can happen to a program. The government initially asked for a commercial off the shelf helicopter. So Lockheed teamed with um, Augusta Westland and took one of the British helicopters and offered it for the presidential helicopter and won uh, the contract. And after they received the contract, government came back and said, well, instead of just flying to Camp David, could you fly to the hidden secret hidden mountain hideout? And Lockheed said, yeah, but it'll take a bigger rotor and more power and a more powerful gearbox. And they said, here's a check. So they started to do it. And the government said, well, wait a minute, he's gonna be on there now, not for 10 minutes, but for hours. Can you put a head in there? And they, Lockheed said, yeah, but it'll cost. And they said, well, Here's the check, you can do it. What if he gets hungry? Well, can you put a chef in a kitchen on it? And oh my God, what if the mushroom clouds go up while he's on board? We need all his communication gear. Can you put that on it? And it drove the price of the single helicopter up to $600 million, which was more than any aircraft had ever cost. And when President Obama got elected and saw what that was going on, he canceled the program. So there you are as a, Performance increased, the price increased until it became unaffordable. And that happened in the case of these other airplanes as well for different reasons, but um, it's a trend. Some of the guys in marketing, when I showed them that chart said, well, yeah, they get fewer airplanes, but we still got all their money. And I said, no, you don't. So I made this chart. This shows the total program value as the numbers, uh, cost of the aircraft increased and the numbers went down. You can see that the total program value increased, decreased also. So you didn't get all their money, you got less money. 
So let's look at how that uh, money is distributed. Here's the production of the 767. It's a little ragged, but typical. You start out at a low production rate, you build up to some peak, and then you eventually fall off because your competitors come up with a competing airplane, cost of fuel goes up, the government requirements go up, um, cost of materials go up, and eventually the airplane has to be retired. So you have this general bell-shaped curve. For a commercial airplane, you have to invest money at the front and then sell enough airplanes to break even, and then you can make a profit. Um, th that investment is the rdt and &E cost, research, development, test, and evaluation. In the government contracting, we have a different situation. We don't have a showroom where we design an airplane put it on the showroom floor, the generals come in, kick the tires and say, I'll take a hundred. Um, we win a contract to develop and design and develop the airplane. So we're, we make a profit on that. And then we make profit on the numbers of airplanes we sell. But as we've seen, as the development costs go up, you don't make more money on the airplane. You actually make less money. Program costs because the numbers come down because the cost has gone up. So how do we predict that at the suitable level for conceptual design when you're trying to do trades? What we used to do is just um, design a nominal airplane and see what the cost per pound was. And then if somebody came up with a new gimmick like um, an electrohydraulic actuator system or a helmet with the HUD projected onto the visor of the helmet, you would say, well, what's it cost per pound? And if it was greater than that nominal cost, you'd say it doesn't buy its way onto the airplane. If it's less, it does, um, but that's not enough, not adequate. So let's look at the cost of airplanes. Here's numbers of a fighter and attack aircraft over the last 50 or so years as a function. Uh, the unit cost is in the number of aircraft as a function of their cost. You see, as the cost goes up, the numbers come down. And there's a, an equation that fits through there um, 27037 times cost to the point minus 0.935 with an R squared of 0.65. And that um, fits onto this curve from also from Augustine's book. This is the cost of stuff that the government buys for the military because it's a matter of record going from bazookas at the top left down to aircraft carriers at the bottom right. And uh, you can see that the airplanes tend to fall above or uh, on that line. And that has a similar um, slope, 0 0.930 instead of 935. And if you put them all together on the same chart and adjust Augustine's 1980 data for 2015, so they're all consistent, you see that the trend line for military aircraft all the military purchases and those new programs pretty much follow the same slope. So I think we can say for no good reason, except statistics, that you can approximate the numbers, fewer numbers of aircraft you're going to sell as the cost increases by that sloping yellow line. So here's a spreadsheet I worked up to illustrate how that might work for a generic kind of program. This is a 10 year program with two years of development in the research development engineering and eight years of production. And frankly, I picked 10 years because that was the largest number of years I could put on a chart and still have numbers that were legible. It looks complicated, but it really isn't. It's just addition and division. So let me go through it here. The first step is the engineering. I assume, um, an airplane that weighed 25,000 pounds with the maximum speed of around Mach 1.5, two prototypes and a thousand airplanes. So the RAND equations, which are generic and publicly available, um, predict that it would cost almost a billion dollars for engineering development in each of two years. And then you go to uh, production where the engineering, sustaining engineering during production um, totals another couple of billion dollars. Then here is the production ramp. It starts at 50, goes to 100, then 150, then plateaus at 200, and it comes down 150, 150 symmetrically. 
Now you have to distribute the costs over those 10 years. And I use something that uh, is called the uh, learning curve it was developed by Ted Wright in the 1930s and has worked since then. We still use it today. Airplanes generally come in at about 85% learning curve, which is the green line there. So when you hear that a new airplane is costing $100 million, well, that's the first airplane, but it comes down pretty quickly and asymptotes at half or less of that price with a 85% learning curve. So I took the RAND equations, got the total program cost and iterated on the initial cost until the learning curve, 85% learning curve in this case, gave me the total that I was looking for. And so that gave me the total program costs, some of the engineering costs plus the manufacturing costs. And then here's the profits. Um, you add up the, uh, well, you negotiate a fee. So in this case, I assume 15%. And uh, you add that to the cost and that's your selling price. The gross margin is the difference between what it costs you and what you can sell it for. And there's a joke about that. The dumbest guy in class comes back to his high school 10 year reunion as a low chauffeur limousine in a silk suit with a diamond for his class ring. And everybody's amazed that Jake made that kind of money. So one of the guys goes over and asks him, how'd you make all that money, Jake? He said, well, you know, when I graduated from high school, I didn't know what I was gonna do. So I watched a lot of sports on TV and drank beer. And I would fall asleep and the beer would go flat when I woke up. So I cut, cut me this sheet of paper and I cut this thing out of it to put in the top of the beer can to keep it from going flat. And when my buddies came over, they thought that was cool and asked if I'd make one for them. So I did. And then their buddies wanted some. So I made a machine that would punch them out for me, punch the part out for me. And then I went to Amazon and boy, sales took off. So I got a factory now with 25 machines and 25 people making it. And that uh, it cost me 50 cents to make them and I sell them for $5 and that 10% profit is how I make my money. So he's still the dumbest guy in class, but uh, he's smart like a fox. And the gross, his gross margin is $4.50. And that represents the amount of money that you can use as a slush fund if you run into problems because you generally have a fixed price contract. And then you have a profit on top of that. And the profit is determined by the selling price divided by the cost. So it, you know, even though you have a 15% fee, your profits are 13%. So a picture is worth a thousand words. And here's what that uh, looks like. The engineering, first two years of engineering are around a billion a piece with the overhead, engineering in red, the overhead in orange, and then the profits in green before taxes. And then you go into manufacturing and you can see that the number of engineers never reached the number required to develop the airplane. So a company needs to have several programs in the um, hopper working on, either the, the engineers go back and they work on R&D, technology development for the next program, or they write proposals or they uh, do other work in the company. So that's the distribution of those numbers. And what we've seen is that when the costs go up, come down. So we want to quantify that using that slope of that curve for the cost of airplanes. Question is, how do you handle um, a, a revision, an additional work on an airplane? So if you wanna add some feature to the airplane, like say a pylon to a wing, there are engineering design hours for designing a new component. And basically I'm suggesting you can just use the weight of that component because the total program cost is the sum of the weights of all the components. The one term is the weight of the airplane the whole airplane. For redesigning an existing component, here is the first five aircraft built and you can see that the costs increase initially at a slower and slower rate until they finally level off and asymptote. But the difference between the first airplane and the second airplane usually reflects lessons learned from the first airplane and changes you have to make. So if you take the um, equation 
for the second airplane and subtract the cost from the first airplane, you get the cost of redesign. And if you use a waste in, weight in the, of a component in that equation, that gives you some way of estimating the cost of a redesign. So let's say we want to add a hundred million dollars uh, uh, to the cost of the program in engineering development because of something we're gonna add. That corresponds to a, a component that weighs 650 pounds. And you can see there at the bottom that the price of the each airplane has gone from just under $27 million to just over $27 million. It adds about $100,000 to the cost of each airplane. So here's the lesson. On that $100 million at a 15% fee, you earn $14.9 million of added profit during development, but you built four fewer airplanes based on the slope of the line, 0.94. You have four fewer aircraft and you lose their profits. So you lose 16 million. In fact, then it costs you a million bucks in lost profits to do that additional engineering work. And that's what we saw in those trend lines for the uh, four programs in the initial charts. The additional work required in the case of the helicopter to add range, kitchen, bathroom, uh, communications gear made it look good initially because you earned profit on that. But the program ended up being canceled in the end because the uh, cost went so high. And that's a difficult problem for the program manager in the initial days because the customer comes to you, he asks for money. How are you going to tell your management that you've turned it down because it's going to cost money in the long run? An even more serious problem is delaying the engineering um, or taking additional time to do additional engineering. Um, so another year I've added in this case. And that adds another, I just assumed it was the same level of effort for the third year. And I assumed that the airplane sales ramped up at the same rate as before, but they came down at the same rate as uh, initially because the airplane initially would have gone out of production because competitors developed airplanes um, requirements changed, cost of fuel went up, and those are all outside the program. They have no influence. So whatever would happen was going to happen in, in the new program too. And uh, you can't expect you're just going to add another couple of years to the program and make up the lost money. So what's sometimes done is add concurrency. So let me show you, look at the red area. You start building the airplane before you've completed the development of it with the intention of coming back and fixing whatever you added to the later airplane, the improved technology, higher technology fix or whatever. And Boeing is doing that, for example, on their um, seven, what is it? The 787, the Dreamliner. And we did that on the F-117, for example, the first F-117s that came out, the stealth coatings were on there like contact paper. They were a thick sheet of stuff with glue and they were stuck onto the airplane while we developed a robotic spray machine to put it on in layers robotically. And then when the machine was working, the rest of the airplanes were built with that new machine. We brought the old first airplanes back, took off this contact paper and sprayed the new coatings on them. So they all came up to the same standard and that turned out to work. But if initially you just extend it and you make $144 million of additional profit in the extra years of work, you actually reduce your profit by over a billion dollars. So you make 150 million on research and development and you lose a billion in production. So the government isn't stupid. I mean, they've learned the lesson. Um, the C-5 was required to have kneeling landing gear so that the guys could jump out of a foxhole, run up to the airplane, pick up a crate of ammo and run back into their foxhole. And that drove the cost of the airplane to have a landing gear that could land an airplane that huge and still lower when it was on the ground. 
And they finally realized that they were never going to use it because they would never take an airplane that big and expensive up to a foxhole. It would always operate from an airfield somewhere far back. Another example, it was going to have supersonic terrain following. And that drove the cost of the airplane going supersonic on the deck and then taking the G's of following the terrain. And it turned out the pilots couldn't take it. It was worse than a roller coaster. And so they never used it. Um, when I asked Lee Nikolai, he was um, in the Air Force for 20 years and retired as a colonel, but then joined Lockheed in the Skunk Works as head of advanced design, conceptual design. Uh, why did you guys give that requirement? And they said, if you had told us what it would have cost, we wouldn't have asked for it. So that's what they do now. This is the old model. The government would issue requirements, in this case, say one five Mach number and seven and a half Gs. And we designed the lightest airplane that would meet those requirements with some little margin. Now they're saying, we don't know what it will cost. We don't know what we need. You tell us, we, we'll tell you what we can afford. We can afford a 24,000 pound airplane. And you tell us where on that design line is the right place to be. If we like it, we'll buy it. And if we don't, we won't. I also promised that you could use this method to um, pay with a cost to win. Um, let's say you design a nominal airplane and it turns out that you've got too much money into it. So you plot the slope of those parameters, in this case, speed, G's and signature. And you see that you um, get the uh, most gain by reducing the, the amount to be cut by cutting the speed of the airplane. Whereas if you come in under cost and you want to put a little money into some new technology, it's stealth that you want to add that has the best payoff. So it's different depending on whether your initial design was above or below your target price. Okay, so we've been talking about costs, but Things have a value. Um, so if you have zero speed on an airplane, you'd have zero cost due to speed, but an impractical airplane. So initially, speed has a value. And at some point, it crosses over. So we want to know, how do you assess the value of something? Well, unfortunately, it's not a simple equation because every airplane is a different mission. But there are techniques you can use. You can, for example, if you want to know the value going from 7.5 Gs to 8 Gs, you can use pilot in the loop air combat simulator, or there's now software with artificial intelligence that will run thousands of air combats and tell you what the value of um, increasing the Gs is, for example, in the change in the exchange ratio. Or in the case of a transport aircraft, you might have a goal of transporting a Marine brigade overnight in one standard period of darkness, as they call it. And um, you would find that if you go faster, you only need fewer airplanes. You need fewer airplanes. Whereas if you go slower, you need more airplanes. And so you can trade the speed versus the cost of the numbers of airplanes you would have to buy to perform that mission. And that's the way you have to assess the value. So in the traditional 20th century way of designing airplanes, we were fighting drag and gravity with lift and thrust. And uh, our engineers were pretty good at getting a good lift to drag ratio and efficient engines producing enough thrust. But in the 21st century to maintain the lead we have, I mean, airplanes are the only thing we sell abroad that brings in positive exchange, everything else we buy now. So innovation has to drive convention. We have to do things differently and affordability has to um, fight the gold plating that comes with adding um, features that are too expensive to the airplane. So the lesson here is that accelerating development because stretching out the development is very expensive, um, makes it more affordable and provides the best value to our customers and the greatest return to the manufacturer. F-117, which is an example of how you do that, the thing you needed to do was show you could build a stealthy airplane. So there's no need to develop a new landing gear. That's came from the F-50. The engines came from the F-18, the displays from the F-18, the 
um, on the fly-by-wire flight controls from the F-16. And that's the way to maintain a technological edge and do it affordably. So that concludes my presentation. I think I stayed within the 40 minute limit and um, I'm gonna be able to take some questions. Great, thank you very much, Paul. Um, so we're open to questions now and the way we are going to do the questions is there is a Q&A panel that you can see at the bottom of your screen. And so if you'd like to type in your question there into the Q&A panel, then um, I'll be working through that to ask the questions to, to folks. And um, Bill and Audrey will also be helping me to make sure that we, we work through the questions there. So, um, so please do go ahead and put your questions in there. Um, I think lots of interesting um, food for, for thought that you gave us, Paul. So thank you for that. Um, I guess our, our first question um, is kind of a, 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 an easy one that's not related to your presentation at all. And um, I guess someone's interested in history, so they were wanted to know who was um, the first dean, or I guess person for you to invite you back to come and share your experience and advice with with us here. Actually, Tom She was the department head at the time, and he invited me back to come back for three years of um, service to the Purdue, giving back to the community. Right, right, and I know Tom is on, on here as well, so. Um, a nice little connection there. And then um, maybe I'll, I'll start with a question um, from my side. Um, so you, you talked a lot about kind of aircraft systems and so forth. Um, what, what's your, what are your thoughts on software? Because I, I, I think I sometimes nowadays we think of our computers as kind of our airplanes, sorry, as computers with wings. So what are your thoughts on, on the cost of software and the value of software? Well, that's a good question, a very good question, because um, in 1985, the F-16 had maybe 200,000 lines of code, and the Dreamliner and the F-22 and the F-35 have like 5 million lines of code, and it can really delay the program, software not being ready. Um, so what we've been forced to use is something developed by TRW called Comico, the Constructive Cost Model, where they divide the uh, development into three levels, complex new program, nobody understands, it requires a lot of people to develop. The other end of the spectrum, well understood, fewer people to develop and then something intermediate. And those curves look like this for lines of code. So you can see out at 5 million um, with the complex code system, how much the costs have increased. And those are engineering hours, which you know, 150 to $200 an hour is what the government gets when we get the overhead. And so um, it's enormous now and it can drive the cost of a program and delay it significantly. It's somewhere I think Purdue could make a contribution to improve this uh, Comico method to uh, try to get something more, more, less judgmental, I guess you'd say. This is just opinion and we'd like to have some data to do it like the RAND equations are based on what? And that's the question. Great, thank you. Okay, I see the questions are pouring in. So um, let me go to to the next one. Um, so when you, when you're thinking about new or developing um, technology where maybe you don't have convention to rely on, um, what specific risks should designers keep in mind? Um, I just you know, some of them will be specific to the technology, but what might be the risks that come associated with just doing new technology? And I think the question went on there to ask about um, also programs like Agility Prime. And before I let you answer, Paul, I just would like to remind people to please try and use the Q&A window. I see some questions coming up in the chat. Um, it will help us to moderate if you can put your questions in the Q&A window. Go ahead, Paul. So the question is, how do you predict something? Uh, yeah, sorry, let me, let me maybe repeat that. So the, the question is asking about when we're doing new kinds of technologies, um, what kinds of risks should you consider? And I think maybe not asking you about specific um, risks to that technology, but just the risk associated with trying to incorporate new technologies in a system. Well, my rule is one miracle per program. So like you see on the F-117 here, the miracle was stealth, everything else off the shelf. You would like to make the airplane better by designing a new landing gear and designing 
custom engines, et cetera. And you don't do that if you're trying to uh, control costs. But if you are trying to assess risk, we have uh, what's called a risk waterfall. You try to prioritize the risks and um, make some judgment call from the experts on what uh, it's going to take. And there's actually a formula that people use. You ask people, how long do you think it's going to take to develop this new technology? If you do it as quickly as you could possibly could, nothing went wrong, how long would that take? Um, if it took everything went wrong, how long would that take? And then what do you think it'll probably take? And then you take a weighted average, one times the shortest, six, four times the longest, and one times the um, maximum worst case, divide by six, and you put that into your schedule. The problem is you would think then that on average with a lot of tech technologies, you would come out somewhere close to your guess. But what happens is an engineer can always make it better. So anybody who finishes soon says, well, if I tell them I'm done, I'm gonna to have to find a new charge number. And I told them it would take longer and I can make it better. So I'm gonna keep working on it. And what you end up with is everything that would have underrun takes the maximum time. And then you're left with all the overruns. So the secret in the skunk works is to be understaffed, undermanned and short schedule. So there's no time to optimize. If in the skunk works, if we get a contract, they take 10% from the top and that's the number you work to. And if you're on schedule and on budget, they take another 10% from you. So you're always pulling your hair out, trying to finish on time, but that's the secret. You don't let people optimize because you can spend money making it better and you are making it better, but you can't afford it. Great, thank you. Um, so I want to stay in a couple of kind of system equations and then, then there are some um, more kind of fun uh, questions related to specific systems. So another question is asking about what is the main factor that affects the cost of aircraft? So is it coming from propulsion systems, materials, guidance, operation, where is it coming from? Well, it comes from that equation, according to the Rand equation, the biggest thing is the size of the airplane, the weight of the airplane. Mm -hmm. the next biggest thing I wouldn't have thought, but it is, it's the speed, the cues that the airplane has to be designed for. And after that, it's economies of scale, it's the numbers of aircraft. And then uh, things like range, payload, Gs are higher order, not that significant. So the biggest thing is the speed, is the weight of the airplane. The next biggest thing is speed, and then the economies of scale and numbers that you're going to build, because you're amortizing the development costs of more airplanes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so it sounds like you're, you're saying it's more about what we're asking the airplane to do than the specific technologies that we're using. Right, well, but do remember the Brand equations were developed when we were doing all aluminum airplanes. And now mm -hmm. we end up spending more money to get composites into the airplane to get the weight down. But weight isn't really the parameter anymore. It's cost. Mm -hmm. And so we really need to be focusing on cost, not traditional things like weight. Got it. Got it. Um, here's a fun one. Have you ever seen any really great design ideas go to waste because of their cost? And if so, what were they, if you can share? Some really great airplanes that... Some really great design ideas go to waste because of their cost. Oh, well, <laughs> the first chart I think had some, the Concorde, mm -hmm. the uh, A380, and maybe the Dreamliner. Okay, yeah, the Dreamliner is a beautiful aircraft. Yeah, um, it's I mean, an amazing aircraft, but they spend so much developing it that they may never make money on it. Hmm. Um, speaking of the Concorde, um, what do you, um, do you see the new boom super, supersonic airliner, I guess the XB-1 having, having a profitable future? If we can ask you to prognosticate a bit. Well, I'm gonna say that as a business jet, it might work, but uh, the fact that it can't fly over land means we have to work on boom and NASA is working that. Boeing and Lockheed are working that problem. If we can get the boom down so it can fly over land. It could be a practical solution, but it, you know, the strength of the shock is proportional to the weight of the airplane. And so um, smaller business jets might be the place to go or regional jets sizes of airplanes, you know, 50 to 100 passengers rather than 
500 or so forth. The interesting thing is the Concorde, if you have offloaded enough fuel, enough passengers to put enough fuel to give it a range from say London to LA, you've got a business jet. You can carry four or five passengers. So it's a cha challenge. It's a neat challenge for us to be working mm -hmm. on. Okay, I, here, here's kind of a maybe a, an interesting philosophical question. So when we, if we impose pressures to people to stay on time, does that uh, create problems for quality or for sort of like, can it put people in ethical boundaries? And if so, how, how do we address that? Well, it's a classical problem because the engineer wants to do a good job. He wants to take the time necessary and a manager wants to submit a low cost bid. So there's a lot of negotiation going on and you have to be as a chief engineer or program manager, you have to be sort of familiar enough with all the technologies that you know when somebody's being optimistic or pessimistic about their estimates. The best you can do is, like we say, keep the people busy, let them know there's plenty of work to be done. They don't have to make it perfect. The enemy are good enough. Um, another thing I think that, that we've been talking a lot in, in the college and that, that you know, gets a lot of sort of popular attention, at least in, in the sort of technology literature is machine learning and AI. And um, do you, how do you think these kinds of tech, like AI and machine learning applied to aircraft design, how might that, um, could that re help reduce the cost of aircraft development? Oh, it has, it has already, yeah. We're using robots to build airplanes, um, artificial intelligence to figure out the best way to put them together. In fact, in the Joint Strike Fighter, we switched from 2D blueprints to Cathedia 3D. And I thought that it was neat. And I said, why don't we put the computers down on the shop floor so the mechanics, instead of printing 2D drawings from these 3D Cathedia designs, why don't we give them the 3D designs? And the government said, don't do that. What you want to do is tell them how to put it together. So we worked it out the sequence of parts that you assemble the airplane in and put that on the floor. And that's what they used. So we're using artificial intelligence already and it'll continue to bring down the cost just like it has with automobiles. Now the problem is you're building 100,000 cars and you're building 100, 200, 300 airplanes. So you can't make the investment without driving the costs out of sight. It's a trade off between craft and automation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Here's another question about thinking about cost. So um, your presentation was really from the perspective of the manufacturer and the cost to the, I guess, the developer and manufacturer. Um, how would this kind of analysis look from the point of view of the owner? Well, the owner just sees a price that he's charged for the airplane. And if I guess, he can afford yeah, it, maybe Go ahead. Well, I say if he can afford it, he buys it. If he can't, I mean, I would like a Ferrari. I can't afford it. So I settle for something else, <laughs> you know. <laughs> he sees okay. the bottom line, which is what they want to charge him for the airplane. Mm -hmm. um, it's the same thing. They sell lots of Corvettes and even more Camaros than they do Ferraris. Fair enough. Okay. Um, if your customer comes to you with a requirement that it's unsafe or unfeasible, or there's some better way to do something, if they're asking you to do it in a specific way, um, how do you go about explaining that to your customer? So how do you, I guess the bigger question is kind of like, how do you educate your, your customer, your client? Well, that's the purpose really of the engineers at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and in Nav Air. Um, they are to be attending meetings, listening to people, knowing what's real and what's BS. And uh, they are more receptive than they've ever been in the past. It used to be they'd give us the requirements and that, that was it. We had to design the requirement. Now, as Colonel Nikolai said, if you tell us what it costs, we'll tell you if we really need it. So on the Joint Strike Fighter, we had three categories, must have, supersonic, V-stole, stealthy, survivable, important to have, and nice to have. And we classified them with the government and they agreed, you know, this is nice to have, but we don't really need it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
I have a follow up on the AI question. Um, and so can you comment on how willing the aviation sector might be to incorporate some of these black box machine learning techniques, you know, where we don't actually know what the code is doing? Um, so what, what would be the aviation sector's willingness to use this kind of code where you can't go and well, check the know, reasoning? We did that with materials before we really understood them. I mean, you test and test and test. And it's when it's tests okay, okay, the black box, you accept it. You have to, because no one person can check 5 million lines of code. So you break it up into segments and you test them. And if they work, you, see, you accept what's in there. So I think the AI design um, code that passes all the tests would be accepted. I think another topic that comes up quite a bit is, um, you know, sort of maintaining our technological um, edge here in the United States and uh, corporations and their, their IP and so forth. Um, as we go more and more digital, and I think also, you know, as we read the, the headlines about people being hacked and so forth, um, what, what might be your suggestions for the uh, United States and, and companies here to maintain their technological advances and kind of not, not lose out? Well, that's my suggestion. Innovation instead of convention, you've got to find new ways of doing things. And you've got to realize when the, you're gold plating and you're putting something on the airplane that really doesn't belong there, it costs too much. Thinking a little bit about the regulators um, and also because you know I spend my time thinking about safety a lot. So as, as you do these trade studies, how do um, FAA requirements and certification requirements and safety requirements, how does that play into this whole picture of um, cost as an independent variable? I'm sorry, give me that question again. So um, how, how do safety requirements and then your certification requirements, how do they play into this kind of view of, of the world with cost as an independent variable? Well, the problem with the, uh, let's see, eight, the Boeing Max, they mm -hmm. have just added a, mm -hmm guy to the board who is responsible for safety and the FAA is going to get more involved and not just rely on the um, engineers in the company. You know, they offloaded a lot of this certification to the company. Boeing said it was going to be okay, so they accepted it and they're getting more involved. So you need an outside impartial, maybe pain in the butt person saying, are mm -hmm. you sure about this? I mean, to rely on one sensor for the control, you know, the pitch down control on the max was a big mistake. Somebody should have said, you can't rely on one sensor. Everything has to be at least double and sometimes quad redundant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think I read an article, they interviewed a lot of old Boeing engineers and the new Boeing is different than the old Boeing. They're more focused on profits and the old Boeing was focused on engineering and safety. And they said this never would have happened in the old Boeing because we were pride, took pride in building airplanes that wouldn't kill people. We would stop the line, so to speak, if we found a safety problem. Yeah, but I, you know, I think kind of as, as you mentioned, with, showed on, on your graph, like ultimately a, a company needs to make a profit, right? So it's, it's about finding that kind of balance in, in doing doing the safety things that you need to do and taking the time to do things properly. But at some point, things also have to go out of the door. Well, the FAA needs more money from the uh, Congress. Is the other mm -hmm. solution? Um. You mentioned that um, the, the Rand, Rand equations, and then I think you also talked about uh, about um, Kokomo. But um, what do you, what would you recommend um, for people to do right now? And other than, of course, we, we need to do more research. And I'd love for you to get involved in, in that. But what would be the best kind of ways to think about cost estimation now? Well, I think the Rand equations might be redone without weight as one of the parameters in talking about materials or manufacturing. Uh, techniques and software has become such a big part of the um, design process that uh, we need something equivalent to the RAND equations for software development. Mm -hmm. I think we're sort of getting towards the end of the time. So if I, if I can ask you sort of a question, I think that is um, 
that it, it, I've just been told I can have one or two more questions, so great. Um, here, here's a nice one. So we have two major companies um, currently really in, in the world um, making the large body aircraft. Do you see that continuing with the two major aircraft companies or is there room for more players or what do you think is going to happen there? Well, I hope there's room for more players because competition keeps you sharp and thinking. Mm -hmm. um, the Chinese are going to perhaps re be entering the business and um, Initially, I'm not too worried about them. I'll tell you some stories about Chinese airplane designers. But um, yeah, I think there's room for some more people. There's mm -hmm. boom, booming air traffic. They don't, Chinese don't really fly the way we do. There's a huge market mm -hmm. there if uh, the, mm -hmm. the airplanes are built and available. Okay, and then let me end with a question which is um, kind of near and dear to, to our heart here as educators. So um, what do you see as the future of aerospace and specifically kind of in terms of what should we be teaching our students? Like if you, know, if you could think about a couple of things that we should really be adding in aerospace education, what might those be? Software engineering. Mm -hmm. um, and some costing. I think uh, we were using weight for so many in school. That's all we talked about. It was the weight of the airplane. We need to add some economics and engineering economics, not Marx versus capitalism, you know. Mm -hmm. Right, let me just do a time check here real quick and see if we can, um, I think we're at the, up at the end of our time. So I would like to thank everyone. I saw so many great questions come by here on the Q&A box. Um, I wasn't able to convey all of them, but um, thank you everyone for, for a great question and Paul for um, giving us some very interesting insights. And I think with that, I'll turn it over to Bill. Great, hey, thanks Karin and thanks Paul. Once again, I really appreciate you Paul spending some time with us this evening. And I know since we've gotten used to the virtual work having you here via Zoom, it's been great to have you. Um, we had a bunch more questions, Paul. I don't know if you'd be interested in us sending those along to you, if that, you were curious about that or not. We just couldn't get to everybody's this evening. No, sure. I'd be glad to try to answer them. That'd be great. I'll go ahead and send those along. We can figure out how to make those available to people. Maybe we can post them somewhere along with the recording of this. So again, you maybe um, group, group them for me so I don't have to answer the same question. You, 12 times. <laughs> 12 times, right. Yeah, that's one of the challenges we, we left with Karen this evening. She had to sort through and I don't know, trying to make sure they got marked, but she was trying to sort through which one follows this one and trying to make a nice job. So again, thank you too, Karen, for yeah, you did a great job. Q and A this. Thank this you. Evening. Great. So with that, I guess I'll wrap this up for this evening. Again, thanks everyone for attending. We had a great turnout, and Paul, thank you so much for participating and being part of our Neil Armstrong Distinguished Visiting Fellows Program here with Aeronautics and Astronautics. We certainly appreciate it. Well, I enjoy it. Thank you. Great. We'll have to get you back to campus pretty soon when we can when we get yeah, you yeah. able to travel again. All right. With that, sounds good, everyone. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you again for joining us. Take care Thank and be safe. Thank you very safe. much, everyone. Bye.